Ladies. <laughs> Namaha. I offer my respectful obeisances. Atma Pradipaya. Unto he who is self effulgent or who gives enlight or who gives enlightenment to the living entities. Shakshine, who is situated in everyone's heart as a witness. Paramatmane, unto the Supreme Soul, the Super Soul. Namaha, I offer my respectful obeisances. Giram, by words. Who is impossible to reach? Manasa, by the mind. Chaita Sam, or by consciousness. Api, even. So translation and purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada. I offer my respectful obeisances unto the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the self-effulgent Super Soul, who is the witness in everyone's heart, who enlightens the individual soul and who cannot be reached by exercises of the mind, words, or consciousness. Srila Prabhupada's purport. The Supreme Personality of Godhead Krishna cannot be understood by the individual soul through mental, physical, or intellectual exercises. It is by the grace of the Supreme Personality of Godhead that the individual soul is enlightened. Therefore, the Lord is described here as Atma Pradi, Pradipa. The Lord is like the sun which illuminates everything and cannot be illuminated by anyone. Therefore, if one is serious about understanding the Supreme, one must receive enlightenment from Him as instructed in the Bhagavad Gita. One cannot understand the Supreme Personality of Godhead by one's mental, physical or intellectual powers. Om Agyan Timbirandasya Gyanajana Salakaya Chaksu Unmilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Bistam Staptitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kedam Mayam Dadati Swapadantikam Pandeham Shiguro Shiyuta Padekamalam Shigurun Vaishnavam Scha Si Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Raganatam Vitam Tam Sajivam 
Sadvaitam Sarvadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Deva Sri Radha Krishna Padam Sahagana Lalita Sri Vishakam Vitamscha He Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Pandu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostate Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi Radhe Vrindavane Suri Vrishavanu Suti Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vancha Kalpa Tarubhishya Kripa Sindhu Pyebhacha Paditanam Bhavane Bhyo Vaishnave Bhyo Namaho Namaha Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Srivasari Gauda Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Ram Hare Ram 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 Hare Hare Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai mm. So from the beginning of this chapter and to and continuing on for many many verses um, Gajendra, who finds himself in a very uh, dangerous and life-threatening situation, um, calls out to the Supreme Lord with great feeling. And it's amazing that although he's in such a precarious situation, he's offering such beautiful and eloquent and most completely perfect prayers of glorification of the Lord. And this particular prayer, and here he's glorifying Krishna as the super soul, who is the indwelling Paramatma within the hearts of all living entities, who is the witness, who is self-effulgent, who needs no other effulgence outside of himself. <laughs> it's perfect. He's the, cannot be reached. This is, I think, the, the main point in this particular verse, which is emphasized both in the translation and in Srila Prabhupada's purport, as Krishna is beyond the reach. Atasi Krishna Namari Nambavedrayam India Seva Mukhihi Jivada Swayameva Sparatyada Srila Prabhupada would often quote this verse to help us understand that the Supreme Personality of Godhead is not within the range of anything material. And even though one may be qualified in all categories of intellectual prowess and abilities, still Krishna is transcendental. He's what we say he works at his own sweet will. <laughs> He's not, what we say, available through the power of one's, even the power of one's devotional service. But he does say, bhakti yamam avijananti yamam yasvi tattvataha. That actually by devotional service, then, only then, is the means for reaching me. But then, even when one is engaged in devotional service, Still, Krishna re reserves the right to reveal himself accordingly. And we, here we are in the month of Kartik, and we very much, every day we're singing the beautiful pastimes of Lord Damodar, and how he was chased and eventually not caught, but permitted to be caught <laughs> by his mother. He was not caught, but he decided to show some compassion and, and what we say, concern for his mother's tremendous effort. She's a pure devotee. She only has love for Krishna. Her only concern is the welfare of Krishna. And she's, she'll make any personal sacrifice to serve the Lord in the most best and most loving way. But still, it wasn't until Krishna d decided to get caught was he caught <laughs> although she had pure devotional service so Krishna's teaching by this particular pastime and there's many other principles that is being illustrated in this pastime but one thing is that he reserves the right to descend into the hearts and lives of his devotee 
according to when he wants. But still, he's attracted by pure loving devotional service. Prabhupada makes a nice point in the earlier verses of this particular section, wherein he says that one of the qualifications that made it available for Gajendra to actually access the mercy of the Lord is he had somehow remembered and chanted perfectly the glories of the Lord and then by chanting beautiful mantras which he had somehow learned in his previous life. <laughs> somehow in this dangerous situation when everything else was, there was nothing else he could call, call out to. He's an elephant. He's glorified for having devotion in such a, what we say, a unusual body. <laughs> such as, you know, we have Hanuman, we have Gajendra, and we have other examples of those in the other species of life who somehow or other are able to access the mercy of the Supreme Personality of God. But he remembered his past life. Or at least he remembered the mantra that he was taught in his past life when he was chanting in devotional service. And Prabhupada said he was a human. But somehow he had whatever he did <laughs> to assume such a, what we say, different type of body. We might have considered it lower in that, on the evolutionary scale. Still, he got the mercy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead by perfectly chanting these mantras. And it was interesting because when Prabhupada makes this point, he makes the point clear that one should perfect the chanting of the mantra. Um, therefore, especially, and he mentions that chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra is of course our mantra for perfection. But he also says one should perfect another prayer for mantra along with uh, our chanting of the Hare Krishna mantra. And then he gives an injury, just an example. He, he chants a mantra from the Brahma Samhita prayers like that. So chanting mantras, chanting nicely. In 1972 in Japan, uh, Srila Prabhupada gave a Bhagavatam class. And he did something which was quite rare, and of course at the time was unusually rare. He uh, spent 45 minutes instructing the devotees how to chant the Sanskrit from the particular verse he was chanting. And he went back over it and back over it and made sure everyone carefully was chanting the pronunciation perfectly. And he didn't stop until that per perfect pronunciation of that verse was gotten by every devotee who was sitting there listening to Prabhupada's class. <laughs> now you might think, oh well, Krishna is Bhava Grahi Janardana. But he takes the essence. So even if one, a child in broken language, but with complete intentions, chants uh, what we say, not perfectly, but his intention is perfect, and Krishna will accept. And we also hear that. So we hear something that is contrary in one sense. But Prabhupada also writes, <laughs> so you, you get the chance to understand both of these dynamics within a certain context. Prabhupada also writes that in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, he especially emphasizes the careful chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra where he, he criticizes, you could say the word criticizes, or he, he rejects any kind of chanting that is not what we say clear and very audible. And then he makes an example. He says, when you're chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, you should use the upper and lower lips and sound the name very clearly, avoiding the hissing sound. And that's from Chaitanya Charitamrita Adi Lila, chapter 17, verse number 32, in the purport. So you don't find too many verses or purports like that where Prabhupada it just talks about that. But occasionally he does. So in this particular, what we say, series of prayers here, it's also mentioned in the early, early verses in the purport. Prabhupada says one should perfectly 
learn how to chant the mantras like that. I mean, His Holiness Lokanath Maharaj has written a book, chant it properly, <laughs> chant, pr pronounce it properly like that. So recently the GBC, I'm not getting into organizational principles here, but I think I just mentioned, the GB said, uh, okay, we've been going on long enough. How many years has our society has been going? Let's get the devotees to chant things rightly. <laughs> you know, I know certain devotees who don't even chant the Sanskrit because coming from certain countries and having some maybe linguistic, linguistic difficulties in pronouncing, they avoid that. But Prabhupada was very, what we say, um, in other words, in order to show the authority to people in general and not look like something, because when you're around certain personalities who have um, the knowledge of this, this, this ch chanting of the mantras, and it's not being chanted properly, we'll look like something less. But Prabhupada really emphasized more the chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra uh, over any any of the main mantras for chanting, but he also wanted other mantras chanted nicely. So making that point here is that uh, Prabhupada said, Gajendra chanted in that way. He chanted with such feeling and such perfection that as soon as his mantra left his heart and mind, he actually realized the presence of the Supreme Personality of God in his heart. It was so beautifully and so perfectly chanted. So he actually, and of course, the Lord appeared to him and saved him from his dangerous position. So, but here, Prabhupada constantly wants us to understand that by our own efforts, devotional service is not achievable. So it's by the grace and mercy of the Lord. So what is the, what is the value of our efforts? It's explained that there's two elements within the process of devotional service that make up the effort that we make. One is the ingredients and one is the mood. The ingredients is following the, the instructions of the spiritual master accordingly and acting in such a way that they, those instructions become the focus of all every activity we perform, even if it's a small thing. Uh, what would be an example of a small thing? And Prabhupada said, if you come into a dirty place and you don't, and you leave it the same way as you see it, you are in the mode of ignorance. He said, therefore, you should make some effort to make it a little better. <laughs> He said, you become, you're the same consciousness as the place. That means if you don't see any need for change. So this is a small thing. You might say it's very kind of like minuscule. But making all the instructions of the spiritual one master more or less a focus of our consciousness makes the more important ones more focusable in our life. In other words, if we take the little things serious, we will all take the things that are most important. And one of the things that are most important is to every day chant 16 rounds on beads without fail, Prabhupada said. When he was asked that instruction, when, when he was asked the, the, the question, Srila Prabhupada, what is your most important instruction to your disciples? He emphasized that pain point. He said, chant 16 rounds on beads without fail. So um, he, he gives the most, the, the essential principle. And we all know that. We've heard that so many times. But by emphasizing the smaller things, we have a tendency to also take the bigger things as what we say foundationals for the form of a meditation on the instructions of the spiritual master. Like that. So the ingredients are there. But what is the, what makes the ingredients work? Just like if you go into a laboratory if you want to make, make an experiment using various chemicals and you're mixing them together, if you have all the chemicals and the ingredients, but the laboratory conditions are not favorable to the experiment, 
the experiment comes out less favorable or maybe even not at all. So the favorable mood in devotional service is mentioned by Śrīla Rūpa Goswāmī, āyābhila sita sunya jñāna kamānāvitam anukulena krishna silanam bhakti uttamam. What is he saying? He's saying that devotional service is only successful when we follow these principles. And what are those principles? That no personal motivation. How do we get rid of personal motivation? Is there a means? You can't say, well, I'm not a pure devotee yet, so what do I do in execution of pure devotional service? So Prabhupada gives a, a, an interesting statement in this regard. He says that there are two kinds of pure devotees. One who is pure in heart and has achieved perfection through the process of pure devotional service. And those who develop pure intention in all the execution of devotional service. And he says, even though I'm not a pure devotee and still I may have the material desires there, therefore I only act on the principles of pure devotional service and do not act in regard to whatever else is there. In other words, I follow strictly the instructions of the spiritual master and push aside any other personal considerations that may be still prominent within my existence. In other words, don't listen to the mind. <laughs> don't listen to the intelligence when it doesn't support transcendental knowledge or the instructions of the spiritual master. So that's a nice formula. He says then, one is a pure devotee by pure intention. And of course, by pure intention, one executes devotional service in that mood and gradually by not focusing on whatever else is there that is not in line with pure devotional service, then one f can frees themselves from material desires, material tendencies like that, like that. So that in gives that as a way to move forward in our devotional service. Because sometimes I meet devotees, they say, well, um, you know, devotional service is is, he is very wonderful and, and the process is that, but I can't do it. <laughs> it's too hard. <laughs> I'm not qualified. Sometimes you hear that. I, I hear that, you know, especially maybe not in Mayapur so much, but <laughs> I hear that a lot in traveling in different places around the world. People lose what we say a sense of self in the execution of devotional service. And what it causes them is they somehow feel less enthusiastic because they feel if I can't, re I, I've already resolved within in my mind, I can't make it to pure devotional service, so why should I try? Let me find a compromise position somewhere below that level of perfection. And then I can be, what we say, okay on that level. I can't be a pure devotee, so, you know, I'll be a happy mixed devotee. <laughs> but that doesn't work. Why doesn't it doesn't work? Because it's contrary to the principles of pure devotional service in the sense that any lower position that one may surreptitiously accept as a position for, for execution causes you to go down to an, a lower position. So devotional service works in such a way as that if we're not moving forward, we're moving backward. <laughs> if you're not making an effort to really perfect your devotional service in the execution of all activities, then the tendency is that one will again be afflicted by certain anarthas, which will cause one to again develop material desires and material tendencies like that. So one has to work hard. <laughs> Emotional service is a very, what we say, spontaneous 24-hour effort to purify our heart and mind. And of course, here we have the example that um, Gajendra, he just, you know, it's interesting. I guess it's, maybe it's not interesting, it's more like natural. I think it's more, that's a better word, natural. And when you're in a difficult situation, you really try harder. 
You know, when the difficulties come, reverses come, calamities come, sometimes even severe calamities like health crises or sometimes you lose someone dear to you or something happens that is, causes a, you know, your mind to be very much disturbed and then devotional service becomes a shelter. We run to the lotus feet of the Lord in great, looking for some relief or some direction in that particular caused by that calamity. But Srila Prabhupada, and he makes this point over and over again that simply by being in the material world, having a material body is a dangerous situation. <laughs> so even though it may be nice, we're here in Mayapur, nice prashad, right? <laughs> and nice kirtans, wonderful association. So many things are ideal here. Uh, one, de one senior devotee said to Srila Prabhupada, but it was Vishnu John Maharaj many years ago. He said, um, he was kind of like making a point that some devotees, they come to Mayapur to enjoy. So Prabhupada said, uh, I mean, Vishnu John Maharaj said, no, you know, we come to Mayapur, but we, we shouldn't try to enjoy. Prabhupada said, no, the Dham is for enjoyment. <laughs> the Dham is for spiritual enjoyment, obviously. That doesn't need to be explained. But, so it is, yeah, it's a very enjoyable place, but still, we do have a material body. Or we have a body that is uh, one of the cause of so many difficulties. So understanding the precarious position, even within the Holy Dham, what means that, that one always takes shelter of the Supreme Personality of God in, in each and every situation. And therefore the Padma Purana gives a very interesting statement. It's kind of like some people will think this is just some hyperbole, some exaggeration. But the statement is quite clear and quite to the point. And it says that to forget the Supreme Personality of Godhead for one moment, it starts off like that, the verse, is the greatest calamity, the greatest anomaly, and the greatest misfortune. To forget the Supreme Personality of Godhead for one moment, it does, it's, this is the actual understanding of the verse, is, is considered to be the worst possible thing that could happen to you. <laughs> so my God, you might think, what is this verse trying to tell us? It's trying to make a point that the nature of the soul's existence is always to be serving the Lord in loving devotional service. And that service is always in consciously applying our intelligence, our mind, our senses, and whatever else we have in trying to serve the Lord in the best possible way, remembering the Lord. And that is the, of course, that is what Rupa Goswami says, is pure devotional service. So this ver verse from Padma Purana really makes the point that uh, anything less than that means we still have to do some work. <laughs> we still have to do some work. So calamities are there to help. When one put, is put into a calamitous or reverse situation in one's execution of devotional service, for a devotee it kind of accelerates one's bhakti. It accelerates one's bhakti. It makes one realize that the things are not as, you know, all of a sudden. So therefore, Krishna sometimes, many times, puts his devotees in difficult situations only so they can remember him more, with love and with feeling like that. Gajendra the elephant, he obviously is teaching us that, you know, that by calling out to the Supreme Personality of Godhead with love and devotion, that is perfection. And of course, Krishna is very kind. Although Prabhupada makes this point throughout the verse, the Lord cannot be, what we say, um, um, reached by the power of the mind. He's beyond the mind. He's beyond the intelligence. And Prabhupada says, or even uh, the verse actually says, 
or even consciousness, Prabhupada says intellectual powers, still but Krishna is very kind. Krishna is very kind and he responds to the devotee when the devotee sincerely calls out to him in love like that. So this is um, this is the mindset of a devotee, how to develop that mood of always be seeing oneself in a situation where I want to remember Krishna with devotion, with love. And that way one is always protected from the material energy and always one in the best possible situation. And chanting mantras, purifying our hearts in this way, brings our consciousness into that loving devotional mood more and more. Okay, so we have about 15 minutes left. Any questions or comments? Yes, uh, Mahashakti, Mataji, Hare Krishna. Is that right? Mahalakshmi, okay, I'm sorry. Mahalakshmi. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Um, there are, we hear there are devotees, the neophyte devotees, they only see Krishna in the temple and in their own spiritual master. And the more one is advanced, the more one can see Krishna everywhere and in everyone. And you also mentioned about taking shelter of destructions in the, of the spiritual master, especially those small ones. And in the desire to see Krishna everywhere, we may find other Vaisnavas who deserve all respect. And we may find that they may have a different detail, which it might be contra contradictory. Different. So how, how do we take shelter of Krishna? By just listening with respect. I don't think it's by retaliating, but sometimes happens. And, uh, or how, how do we take shelter of Krishna in such a circumstance? The circumstances, the situation doesn't, it causes your mind to be disturbed rather than, your, the question is, in a situation which is somewhat awkward, your mind is being disturbed? This once a spiritual master might have given a specific detail, uh -huh. and another Vaisnava may give a, one a, a detail which is contradictory, or at least to one's capacity to see oh, things. Two different instructions which are contrary. Yes, how do we, and we want to see Krishna in every one. How do we take shelter of Krishna in such a circumstance? Just by respecting, not acting, by retaliating, which I think is not the... Oh, oh, let me how? let me see if I can understand. You have a spiritual master who has given you a certain instruction. You have an uh, immediate authority who gives you another instruction which is a little contrary to what your spiritual master instructs. Is that it? Hmm. Well, it's not like we have to blindly follow things. We can present our, what we say, confusion, and present that I'm understanding your instructions, but I, I understand from my spiritual master this is different. So you ask the question. So you inquire in a more of a, in a submissive way, not challenging, and you try to get a clarification. Now, if that person continues, then you might it depends. I mean, if it's something like break the regulative principles, <laughs> then, then you you just don't follow, <laughs> obviously. Taking shelter of Krishna means remembering Krishna and then acting according to the situation. So in this situation, you would inquire to get a clarification on what you should do or how you should properly act. We can do that. It's not that we have to follow instructions that are, what we say, either apparently contrary, apparently contrary, or somewhat confusing and we can't understand it, or even maybe too difficult to execute without first inquiring how best I understand this, how best to execute it. Okay. That is allowable. Mm -hmm. But then once everything is is responded, then you have to act. Mm -hmm. Yes, Prabhu.
Maharaj, just also in this regard, uh, I had heard that the Shiksha Guru acts as an Anga or limb of the Diksha Guru. Yeah. And the Shiksha Guru's instructions should support the instructions given by the Diksha Guru to that's enhance. Is that true, Maharaj? That's, yeah, that's mentioned that if there's contrary, then one has to accept Diksha. Thank you for clarifying that, Maharaj. Yeah, that's mentioned. That's mentioned Chaitanya Charitamrita in the beginning. But that's an also a, that's that's an etiquette of execution. That the the diksha, the shiksha guru. And sometimes we all of a sudden find ourselves getting instructions from someone who is not a shiksha guru, but someone who is in a process of authority or a position of authority. Then again, you make that point, and you inquire, because you don't want to break the instructions of your spiritual master simply because of convenience. <laughs> so the devotees have to be, what we say, aware of the instructions of their spiritual master, Srila Prabhupada, our spirit, your spiritual master, in order so we don't get. We make what we call committing an offense simply by unknowing. If we don't know the instructions and we go ahead and do something which is not in line with the instructions, thinking it is the instructions, then we will commit offense. That's why Prabhupada said, you must read my books. <laughs> you must hear my lectures. You must understand this in practice, not only in theory. <laughs> Maharaj, I, I always can, or generally I consider my authorities also on the platform of Shiksha Guru. So is, is a spiritual authority a, a Shiksha Guru in all cases or the differences? Ah. Well, in this gun we don't, we haven't adopted formal Shiksha, although there has been an effort to make it. So one can, what we say, accept on a, what we say, an informal way, a person who is going to be your shiksha. But if someone from the, who is not agreed to, to you by that, then you don't really have to accept. But if it's an authority, then you just question based on by what the authority says. So we find ourselves, it says Prabhupada, the Shastras say one has one initiating spiritual master, but one may have many instructing in spiritual masters. Mm -hmm. You can have as many or as little as you feel like you need. And that's nice. That's nice. And that opens up opportunities for greater knowledge and greater, what we say, service. And of course, we understand that the Diksha Guru is not always available to give the instructions. <laughs> yes. There was a question, Sri Devi? Yeah. Thank you, Maharaj. Um, on the topic of uh, pronunciation, I would like Your Holiness to just uh, guide us on this point because, especially in the Western world, we see a lot of. Um, fanciful pronunciation like Gorpunim, maybe because he was born under a neem tree or something. It's of not Gorpunim, it's Gorpunima. Right, right. Mm -hmm. I'm just uh, illustrating. Mm -hmm. Or they say... I got chastised. I said that one time and one senior devotee immediately chastised me. Oh. And I had never forgot that. Yes, mm -hmm. That was at least 10 years ago. Yeah. Gorpunima. <laughs> or they say Ishkon because maybe Krishna, it's Krishna consciousness. So we say Ishkon. Or we say Ramu for Hare Rama, when cha like you explained in the Kirtan, Ramu and Krishnu. Or so could you just tell us what happens when we mispronounce? Two lasi, two lasis. That's if you want one lasi, you want two lasis. So. <laughs> or maybe three lasis. <laughs> it's two lasi. Or Tulsi. <laughs> it's not too lasi. We say that all the time, right? 
Uh, Prabhupada, Prabhupada in one lecture, he said, I know you are trying your best, but please don't call your spiritual master a cow. <laughs> one day guru shi charanada vindam, one day guru. It's guru, 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 not garo, garo. They were saying garo, garo. So Prabhupada, he said it very sweetly in a very somewhat jovial way. He's, <laughs> Please don't call your spiritual master a cow. <laughs> I know you're trying your best. <laughs> so yeah, so it's nice to get it down. In the beginning days of our movement, we were not we were not talking about these things, but now it's become more of a feature of of importance that we learn how to chant the mantras properly, <laughs> like that. Yes, Mataji. <laughs> the microphone's on its way. Okay. Hare Krishna, just one story regarding intent. Um, we were in the back of the car with Srila Prabhupada. We were coming back from a morning walk. And one of our God sisters used to chant she used to just like mumble and she used to actually foam, she actually would foam at the mouth when she would chant and we always, she, we always used to sort of avoid her because her chanting was so incessant and so sort of crazy. So we're in the back of the car with Prabhupada and she was chanting and we were all thinking, oh, Shuddha Prabhupada's really going to, you know, correct her on her chanting. And instead, Prabhupada turned around and go, very nice chanting. <laughs> <laughs> and we just all were like, you know, flabbergasted, but it was, it was sort of the intent was there. She was like, she get, worked herself into a frenzy, and that was his response. Yeah, so, I think he also wanted to instruct the other devotees not to criticize her. Yes, bro, that was right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah so that likes me Moni, Mataji. Just, um, just the, in, in relation to Mahalakshmi, Mataji's question at the beginning, um, Sometimes, apparently, there's a contradiction, but if you understand the intention, then you can find a resolution. Nice so story, yeah. if you inquire to understand the intention, because sometimes the details of something in one circumstance or another circumstance may be one way, but then if you understand the whole intention, you may find that it applies in different ways in different circumstances. So inquire about the intention rather than the what is specifics, actually, yeah. yeah. Sometimes that helps. Yeah. If once you get the intention, then you can understand everything else. Yeah. That's a nice point. Thank you. Very well. Thank you. Yeah, and I think Krishna consciousness really is based on intention. <laughs> I think her, your story there about the chanting was that she intended to chant as much as she could in the best possible way she could, but maybe fell short of perfection, but her intention was to chat. <laughs> Again, was there another question? Yes, Prabhu. Yeah. There is different types of dandavats. Different types of? Dandavats. Dandavans. Offer obeisances. There are different types of offer, offering obeisances. So, which is the best and uh, which which dandavat is uh, which purpose uh, specified dandavat is used? How how best to pay obeisances? Well, they say five point and eleven point. That's the mentions. Eleven eleven points touching the floor, eleven points of the body, and five points of the body touching the floor. So both of those are considered, what we say, acceptable forms of. But you're trying to. Your question is, which one's better, or which is the? So I mean, if you try to play pay full dandavats in the Radhamadava temple, you might find a little bit of a problem sometimes. <laughs> So, you have to use your intelligence <laughs> to see how best to offer your humble obeisances 
to the Supreme Personality of Godhead and his devotees. So either you use five point or eleven point, the scene, whatever is most appropriate for the situation. I think it, it really depends on your heart. <laughs> you, even if you offer full Dandavad obeisances and you're thinking, uh, I hope I don't get stepped on <laughs> while you're, ch you're down there. That's not much of an obeisance. So. <laughs> so why, I just say that, Mat Prabhuji, why there are different kinds of Dandavat? Why? Why there are, if this is the best, this one you say that best, best then why this, the, there are different kinds of, different types of Dandavat? In Odisha people say that, in Odisha people say that holding like a rod, fell uh, uh, down just like a rod is the best, best one. Why is it different kinds? Different types of people, I guess. I mean, ladies are not recommended to pay full dandavats. You don't find that very often. Prabhupada said they don't have to. They can do the five-point dandavats. Prabhupada mentions that. So, you just have to do a little research and see what is the origin of the shastras that talk about dandavats. <laughs> I'm not exactly sh first on which one is better. I think they're both fine. And this, again, it's it's the feeling within the heart. Krishna said, "Manmano bhava mad bhakto mam yaji mam namaskaru." My papa said, "Nam nam namaskaru" means offer your obeisances to the Lord. He doesn't say one is better than the other, or there's you can choose which type. Whatever works for you. <laughs> Whatever works for you, best. There was another question? Yes. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, Krishna wants us to be happy by living in cooperation with Him. And uh, the devotees who are trying to be surrendered. The devotees souls, are trying to? Who are trying to be surrendered souls at His lotus feet. Sometimes he may want to do mixed devotional service and he puts them in difficulties so that he teaches that he does to Arjuna. He becomes his guru. Yeah, Prabhupada, I was just listening to Prabhupada speak about that. He said, just because you, you're a devotee, don't think you won't undergo difficulties. Yeah, of course. And then he uses the example of the Pandavas, how their wife was, you know, was insulted and how they were banished to the fires, how their kingdom was usurped how they were tried to be killed in so many different ways. Prabhupada, making that point, said devotional service means ultimately to purify your heart. So you might find yourself in difficult situations. But again, what makes a difficult situation something different is when we surrender to the Lord in that situation. And we use that situation to become more Krishna conscious. So my question was, Maharaj, that because Queen Kunti prays for uh, difficulties, so she she can think of Lord Krishna. That was her mood. But uh, for an individual devotee, it can be another thing. You want to pray like that too? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's enough difficulties in this world. We don't really have to pray for it. But if you want to, it's available. No, <laughs> you can, you can think, if you want. I think most devotees' attitude would be to face the problems and not invite the problems. Pray to purify your heart so you can become a better devotee. Pray that you can chant nicely. Pray that you can become more of a servant to the Vaishnavas. These are the, these are the prayers that are recommended. Prayer that, pray that you can become an instrument of Prabhupada's mercy to spread Krishna consciousness to others. These are the prayers that are really helpful. So, so we can, can we pray, pray like this that we face the problems by surrendering at your lotus feet in difficult times and then... I miss, I miss one word in there. Can we pray for problems? No, no, no. I was saying that can we pray in this way that, O oh Lord Krishna, please let us uh, take shelter of your lotus feet when we are in problems, but let us not invite problems. <laughs> because what, Kinti, Queen Kunti is the uh, I, what example. Book have Sometimes you, we misunderstand. What shastra her. are you reading? <laughs> it's not in the Bhagavatam. 
It's like we don't say, my dear Lord, I really love you, but don't give me any difficulties. <laughs> uh, it sounds like a marriage vow. <laughs> but listen, it doesn't work. You know, whatever happens by way of the either the Lord's arrangement or the Lord's permission. Uh, Krishna allows things to happen, not that he wants things to happen, but he allows it to happen or makes things happen. He's the permitter also and also one who makes things happen and he also allows things to happen. Uh, yes, Maharaj. So he, he, if he allows certain things to happen to us, even though he doesn't want, he doesn't permit it, it doesn't initiate it, we should accept that as our, our what we say, an opportunity for our spiritual advancement. An opportunity for purification. Yes, Maharaj. Krishna is kind to his devotees. Always. But, but he's not kind to those who are not surrendered, who is atheist, who he's kind. Krishna is kind to everyone. Krishna is kind to yeah, yeah. everyone. Yes, but he shows his kindness in different ways. If he's a demon, he kills him. That's his kindness. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Krishna, you can't say Krishna is unkind. He is kind. His kindness is beyond our understanding. But how he exhibits his kindness is different according to the circumstance. He's always kind. Yeah. He's never unkind. But in a, he has his choices to be kind. He wants you to be kind too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Maharaj. He, he becomes kind to you, so you learn how to become kind. <laughs> yes. I understand. This is the last question because I'm supposed to stop at nine o'clock. So. <laughs> Hare Krishna Maharaj. Thank you for this wonderful class. Uh, just my question was uh, regarding, uh, you said the principle of pure devotional service. We are from our spiritual master. And then even after knowing the principle, sometimes, as you said, there are like some kind of devotees who feel ki we can practice to a lower level. Yeah. And But the, my point is, even after knowing that there are some kind of attachment, we want to surrender and our intentions are proper, but that is not reflecting immediately to our uh, actions. So what is the uh, controversy in this? Is the intention enough or it should reflect in actions exactly? Is our... Although we have good intentions we, and we try to surrender, still we, we don't, we're, there's some imperfection, there's some flaw, there's some... Still you try your best. You can't expect perfection on everything you do. You just do your best. What is your best? You try to serve the Lord in the best possible way. And what is that best possible way? You use your intelligence and you remember the instructions of the spiritual master. What can you do? The results are, Krishna says, you have a right to perform your duty, but you're not entitled to the results of action. Never consider yourself the cause of the results of your activities. Never be unattached, not attached to doing your duty. So you have to ex execute your devotional service, but the results are not up to you. Do your best. When Krishna takes the... He sees what you're trying to do as opposed to what is actually happening like that. He sees your intention. That's why even so a person may be expert in executing a particular service, but they're proud or they have some motivation. Krishna is not going to accept that because their intention is different, although their expertise and execution is very nice. We may see it as very nice. Oh, this is so nice. Well, but Krishna is seeing the intention or the motivation behind it. Like that. Mm -hmm. And there's many examples like that. One man, he was, he was in Vrindavan. Devotees invited him to come. He was a Brijabhasi and he came and they said he could, and they wanted him to lead Kirtan. So Prabhupada let him lead. And he was very beautiful chanting. But he was trying to impress others by the expertise of his chanting. Prabhupada stopped it and had let someone else lead who couldn't sing at all. <laughs> and Prabhupada was really enjoying this other devotee who was singing off key. And this other guy, this, uh, this other Brijabhasi, he was sitting there and he was really unhappy because all of a sudden he's taken off and this person who can sing is singing. 
But Prabhupada could understand that this other devotee, although he couldn't sing properly, he was trying his best to serve. And this other person was just trying to present himself as somebody who was, you know, expert. And you know, he was proud. He had some intentions like that. So the Lord can see that. The pure devotees can see that, you know. So do your best. That's all. <laughs> The problem is, when we start doing our best and we start becoming even a little bit good at what we're doing, that element of, oh, I, I got it down now. A little pride starts to ex come in the executing of our service. And we put a lot of emphasis on the expertise rather, in, rather than, the, than the mood of devotion. So that's important to understand. It's the mood of devotion that Krishna sees. Patram pushram phalam tayam tayome bhakti panasyati taraham bhakti uparitam asnami prayatat manaha. So he's taking the devotion and not what is being offered. Okay, so thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada ki